Good evening. This is John Milburn for Laws 11057 Introduction to Law. This is week six of term two, 2019. We have a good number of people online. Thank you so much for joining us each week. I'm going to start with a request of you to tell me some things that you've learned about legal research. And I'm going to ask this question. Can anyone tell me what's absolutely great about the Federal Register of Legislation? And as we do that, I'm going to share the screen so we can look at that on the screen. So what's the best thing about the Federal Register of Legislation? Any, any thoughts? It's comprehensive, says Paul. Yes, I agree, totally. It's easy to use, says Emily. Kieran says the interface is good. Very good. All right, it's user friendly, says Tani. Thank you very much for those comments. Now, I'm going to ask you this. Well, firstly, I assume that your, Timothy says, finding up to date and consolidated legislation. That's a very good comment. Um, I do take it that you are looking at the Federal Register of Legislation on your screen. Is that correct? If you just give me the, yes, thank you. For some reason, it's just not quite coming up as clearly as I'd like on my screen. All right, so the next question is this. Looking at the Federal Register of Legislation, I'm going to ask you if you can tell me something that you found when you were just searching away that you thought, that is great, I must remember that, maybe something you've put in your toolkit. Now, don't be afraid to share. You know, we love to be collegiate, we love to share information. So if you found a little gem of material in the Federal Register of Legislation, please share it with us. Was it something to do with the way in which the search platform works? Was it some trick that you found in looking at bills or finding explanatory memoranda? Is it something to do with timelines that you find in the legislation? Was it something to do with finding acts at a particular point in time? So Emily says the information tab has heaps of information. Thank you, Emily. So I'm looking for the, oh, the information tab, bottom left. We'll just follow that. And there we go. So Emily says, have a look at that. It's a good way to gain information. And in particular, look at the PDFs. All right, so thank you very much for that. Now there must be somebody else. We're not gonna leave Emily to do all the hard work, are we? Anything else in the Federal Register of Legislation? All right. I'm not gonna give away any answers. You know that um, this is covered in the third of my legal research videos. If you haven't looked at those videos, please do so, study them and go exploring. Spend an hour or two just clicking on links, finding information, cataloging the information in a way that makes sense to you. Let's move on now to Queensland legislation. What can people tell me about the Queensland legislation? What's good about it? And I trust you're looking at that web page, Queensland legislation. What's, what's great about Queensland legislation? Any thoughts? There must be something. So the table to the right hand side when searching legislation says, Emily, it has important dates. Thank you. So the table on the right hand side, which table is that in? The what's new table? Oh, acts is passed. All right, thank you very much. Gary says it shows subordinate acts when you look at, at the acts. Yes, and Emily says, Go into acts as passed, then choose the act. Gary says, if you want subordinate acts or subordinate legislation, then look, look at the act and it will provide you with that further material. Excellent. All right, now I'm gonna ask you this. Um, have you catalogued your bookmarks? So with mine, for example, I'm not sure if you can see this, but 
digital library, services free, Federal Register of Legislation is the first one, so going back to that. So let's just explore this a little bit more. Um, in terms of the Federal Register of Legislation, I take it that if I asked you to do this now on your screens, all of you could easily find the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act of 1999. Could we do that? All right. If I asked you to find the bills relevant to that legislation, I'd ask if you would be able to find that. Would you be able to find the legislative instruments, the notifiable instruments? Would you be able to find the point in time legislation? So these are the sort of things that I want you to find when you're looking through the material to gain a better understanding of how to work your way around legislation. Now, even if you don't intend to practice as lawyers, in whatever field you will work, you are going to find occasion to look at legislation. And to properly understand legislation, you first need to find it, and you need to understand some of the basic rules. And that means having some working knowledge of how to use these excellent platforms. In terms of the Queensland position, Queensland legislation, you should be able to find the explanatory notes. So can tell one, someone tell me how to find an explanatory note through Queensland legislation website? I take it that we know what an explanatory note is, so I won't explain that. But how would we find one? Who wants to guide me through this? You can unmute your microphone if you like. And if you're thinking, gosh, I don't know how to do this, then you must learn how to do this this week. It's the sort of thing that you'd want to put into your toolkit, I should think. All right, so is anyone going to tell me how to find an explanatory note? And Gary says, I use the Queensland Parliament website. Very good. And you can see that I've got Queensland Parliament website hidden behind Queensland legislation because that's the next place we'll be going. But you're absolutely right. You can certainly use the Queensland Parliament website in order to find explanatory notes as we, as we call them in Queensland. All right, so as an exercise, I would like you during the week to, for example, go to the Victims of Crime Assistance and other Legislation Amendment Act, see when it was introduced, see when the third reading occurred, find the explanatory note to that and then work from there. The alternative is to go to Queensland Parliament website and I don't find this quite as user friendly, but it's another way of finding these, um, these pieces of material. So you can go into bills, you can find out what's going on and um, it will provide you with the information. So again, go exploring because I do cover this in detail in the um, legal research videos. So I won't go through that again now. All right. Now, can anyone tell me what LAWLEX is all about? L-A-W-L-E-X. What is it? How do you use it? Do you use it? Have you got it bookmarked? If so, is it useful? How is it useful? So LAWLEX. Anybody know what it is? All right, so what you can do is search for legislation and regulations by way of category. There it is, Timothy got it. You can search by way of topic. That's the important part. So I think I mentioned this earlier that um, because I've been around the law so much, you tend to know the key piece of legislation in a particular area of practice. But if you don't, um, and you want to know what is the key piece of Queensland legislation relevant to, for example, a state practice, then you may not automatically know it's the Succession Act. So Law Lex will help you to find that it's the Succession Act that you need to consider. So it's a good little useful tool. All right. 
Now, how many of you feel comfortable in knowing your way around Westlaw and LexisNexis? And we'll add in um, CCH to that. Yes or no, and you can be honest here, I won't name names. So just a quick yes, no, do you feel comfortable that you could at least get your way around Westlaw, LexisNexis and CCH? Excellent. I'm getting the correct answer from a number of students and some honest answers. Very good. All right. Please, this week, make sure that you become even more familiar with those excellent platforms. They're very important. Okay, um, now we know what case law is all about. Can I have a quick poll if I wanted you to look up a case other than by simply Googling it, how would you go about finding it? What's your favorite platform for finding cases? Quick straw poll. We're getting some votes coming in now. Westlaw, lots for Osley, some for Jade, a little more for Westlaw. Okay, so develop that, include that in your um, toolkit, see what works for you. And of course, you're not restricted to one. Does anyone know what we mean by noting up a case? Or shepherdizing, we sometimes call it. If I said to note up, would you know what that means? And of course, if you don't have a preferred way of looking up cases, then you need to work on that this week. If you don't know what I mean by note up, let alone how to use note up facilities, then you've got to work on that this week. Lots of commentary in the legal research videos. And thank you, those of you who have said, yes, I know what note up is, and I'm assuming that you know how to use it and when you might use it. So you need to understand note up methodology and um, work on it from there. So here is some something that I think is on the legal research video. It's a link, I'll just share it with you now. And I'll share the screen in order to do so. So this is from Ostley and it's noting up methods. It's reference to David Vale. It describes what noting up means. Noting up legislation is the first part. Noting up cases is the second part. And you'll see that this is really useful and probably something you'd want to incorporate into your tool, toolkit, at least by way of reference, I should think, because it has a quick guide to how to reference a range of materials uh, using a different a, a range of platforms, Osley, LexisNexis, Westlaw, etc. So you'll also become, you, you'll need to become used to some of the um, platforms within the overall platform, such as CaseBase in LexisNexis or FirstPoint in Westlaw. Any questions? All good? All right. We'll keep moving on. Now, the Queensland Reports website is very important, very useful, and um, we'll go to Queensland Judgments. Again, just a quick share, and you can be honest with your response. Do you know how to use the Queensland Judgments? website? Have you, have you browsed? Have you looked around? Got a feel for it? You're getting some good honest answers. Thank you. Ah, Gary's onto something here. He has, yes, he has, and he's subscribed to their emails. Excellent way of um, proceeding. You can do the same thing for, through Jade. So if you haven't subscribed, please consider it. Um, I certainly subscribe 
through Queensland Judgments and Jade. And that way you get up to date material in relation to the area of practice that you're interested in. Um, Paul says, yes, he's done the same thing and done so with Jade as well. And you could imagine how satisfying it would be to be able to cite a case that was reported by the High Court the day before your examination because you got wind of it via the um, material that came to you into your inbox. So that would be a nice little um, thing to add into your examination, wouldn't it? All right, so please consider that and please do look at Queensland Judgments. It's an excellent resource. Um, some of the things that you might find useful, for example, the UCPR, which would be excellent, um, a resource for civil practice, which describes and provides commentary in relation to civil proceedings generally. All right, we'll stop that share. Are we doing, are we doing well so far? Are you with me with this? Okay. And I do want you to spend some time to go through the material because it's all very valuable. And in the course of doing so, you'll get used to some of the terms and um, you'll be able to um, identify um, some of the things that are important. Another one is the Queensland um, law reports. I'll share the screen. I know I'm covering some of the material that's in the online legal research videos. So I'm really doing this to um, encourage you to, to look at those videos and study them. What you can do is obtain your free weekly Queensland Law Reporter by email. Of course I do, it comes out on a Friday afternoon. It's an excellent publication. Um, the editors and the sub-editors do a great job. And here you'll find the authorised reports of the Supreme Court of Queensland. Now you can access this through the Supreme Court Library also, but I think having direct access to the Queensland reports is also very valuable. Now, when I first started practicing in law, we didn't have um, the internet. We, photocopiers had only just come in. Um, we were using Gestetner machines before that, stencil machines. We didn't have facsimile machines. And um, so you can understand it was a completely different era. One of my first jobs was to receive the paper version of amendments to legislation and literally I would have to cut out the sections that represented the amendments, go to the act that we were using as our main piece of legislation and I would glue in, literally glue in the amendment so that when you looked at a piece of legislation like the Property Law Act, which in itself was huge, it was made far more bulky because of all the amendments that were glued in. So if you wanted to look at section 158A of the Property Law Act, and I don't know if there is a section 158A of the Property Law Act, you would go to the paper version and you'd open it up carefully and you'd have to look to see what had been crossed out by way of um, um, a repeal and you'd look at what had been added in by way of amendment. So the point is that practicing in the early, in the 70s and the 80s was really hard work because literally to find out what the legislation was in itself was quite a task. And of course, we didn't have note up facilities where you could follow a link to the relevant cases. That was a whole different range of paper based legal research. So we've got these great resources now and my encouragement to you is please use them. They're there and they're relatively easy to use. Is anyone finding the process of legal research really tough and would like to suggest that my flippant comment about legal research being relatively easy these days is actually incorrect and it's a lot tougher than they thought or that I should give credit to? Because you're allowed to disagree with me. Sky says, easy but time consuming. Emily says, time consuming. Samara said, took a bit of time to get your head around it. Sky says, as expected, easy but time consuming as expected. All right. Um, if you find something that really helps you, that really surprised you in a good way, please share it through Moodle. Likewise, if you found that something was really frustrating and difficult, please ask for some help and we'll see if we can collectively help each other in that regard. 
All right. <clears throat> now, um, the Queensland law reports, the Queensland reports rather, therefore, are very important. You do need to know about case citators, what that means. And when you're using citators, the three main searches are finding cases on a subject area, finding out details of a case, and finding cases that have been cited, uh, that have cited a piece of legislation and vice versa. So you can use these note up facilities to bounce one way to the other and, and vice versa. All right, Jade. There's been a bit of talk about Jade. How many of you use Jade? You can be honest, I won't name names. So just a quick anonymous, do we use Jade, Jade Barnett, which stands for Judgments and Decisions Enhanced. Oh, and we're all, almost all of us, yes, and another not yet. So that will change. And another, not much at all. Um, so again, even though I find Jade terrific resource, you may not find it to your liking and that's perfectly fine as is the case with all of these um, platforms. Some you just find very useful, others not so much. Make sure that this is catalogued and put into your um, legal toolkit. So if I said to you, I want you to research this task, I'm going to ask generally how you might go about it. What if in the take home exam, I asked you to research relevant cases that relate to negligence and falling from a balcony? How would you go about that? The law relating to negligence in the context of someone falling from a balcony. Anyone willing to describe the process? Tell me what they do. And of course, those that have watched the legal research videos will know that I actually deal with this particular scenario. Matthew says, keywords. Yes, very good. Boolean connectors says Emily. Yes. Search words says Samara. And when we talk about Boolean connectors, we're really talking about typically and, so that when you go into a search engine, you might type in the words, negligence and balcony and fall, which means that you're asking the search engine to perform a search where you're looking for all three of those words. In Jade, for example, you can undertake the search function by inserting those words, then selecting things like advanced filters. You can then look at collections, selecting, for example, only High Court decisions or only Supreme Court decisions. And then you can drop down from the topic to select further filters until you come to the cases that you think are the most relevant. So that's a way of searching the primary sources of our law, legislation and case law. A lot of people are scared by that, choose not to do it, and instead commence their research by looking at the secondary sources of law and you know what I mean by primary sources and secondary sources. So I'm going to ask you this question generally. If you decided not to search the law by reference to the primary sources, and you decided to go to the secondary sources first up, what are some of the secondary, resource, secondary um, sources that you have found particularly useful that you'd like to recommend to others? So we're getting some votes coming through already. So we're looking for secondary sources of the law that are really useful and that you'd like to commend to your colleagues. Renee says Caxton, yes, and I've got Caxton in paper form, the last version of when it was paper form behind me. It's a red book, very thick, but it's also online and it's free of charge, it's excellent. And it's from the Caxton Street Legal Centre. Gary says legal dictionaries, yes. Sandra says textbooks, Queensland Criminal Code, etc. Emily says textbooks, journal articles, speeches. That's interesting. No one's given me some of the other general law platforms that we find online through our major 
legal providers, which are available through the CQU Law Library. That's a hint as to another way to search in a general sense. I think we talked about these last time. Ah, that's it, Renee's got it. Hallsbury, yes. Timothy says CCH, yes. So what's the, um, the if you like, the main competitor to Hallsbury is the laws of Australia. So they're a couple of major legal platforms that provide you with a lot of information generally. The Australian Encyclopedia of Forms and Precedents is another one if you're looking for precedents for a particular area of practice. All right, <clears throat> so now we're moving on to a brief overview of what is in the fourth video for legal research. Um, there's the CQU Law Resources Guide that you need to consider. And in the fourth video, we deal with um, commentary about Lexis Advanced Pacific and um, some worked examples there. Again, in the, using that pl platform in the video, I deal with negligence and balcony and fall. Have a look at that. Um, look at case-based cases and then consider um, Law Now legislation, which is uh, available on subscription. Another general resource that you'll probably find useful is Australian Legal Words and Phrases. And you, it's got a search function so that you can find answers relatively quickly. From that, in the fourth legal research video, we move on to Westlaw. Um, the main things to look at there would be First Point. So First Point is an online case law research tool. It provides legal citation information and it provides useful summaries of important cases. The laws of Australia, also very important to look at in terms of providing general information. And get to know the drop down facilities, the way in which the search engines work. Also, you'll find a lot of good useful fact sheets. For example, the fact sheet for First Law. Um, first, sorry, first point guide fact sheet. CCH, excellent in family law, for example. And um, with CCH, you can use Boolean collect connectors as you can for other search facilities. And you'll get to know some important basic cases. So in, in the context of family law, I refer to good against good, good with an E at the end and um, uh, you can search different ways for the Boolean connectors, such as um, uh, using WS facilities. But I'll leave you to look at the research videos, work your way through those. And if you haven't already done so in some detail, please do so this week, so that you're up to date with where we should be. During the course of all of the legal research, you might see reference to authorised reports. Just a quick yes, no, anonymously. Do you know what I mean by authorised law reports? Yes or no? We're getting mostly some yes, a couple of no's, and that's fine. So if you don't know, this week, please make a point, or we get a yes and a no. Um, if you don't know what I mean by authorised law reports, then this week, please do some research. It's on the fourth video for legal research and make sure that you do know. Then the next stage is to catalogue how you would find the authorised law reports in a particular area. So if, for example, you determined that the Commonwealth law reports are the authorised report series for the High Court decisions, then the next question is, well, where do I find these Commonwealth law reports? Just on that point, sometimes you'll see that the material um, for a decision comes out in an unauthorised form fairly quickly. It's still authoritative, it still can be used in court, and the authorised report series will follow sometime later. 
once you've reached the stage where there's an authorised report, then that's the one that's to be cited in court, which means therefore that that's the one that I'd prefer you cite in an examination context. All good with that? So you can't very well cite the authorised law report for a particular case unless you, you know what I mean by authorised law reports and then secondly, you know where to find them. Okay? And sometimes in a textbook or a commentary or something else, you might see multiple reports to the same case. Try to select, if you can, the authorised report if you're going to cite it. What that means is that you need to consider why we do that. And we do that because of the Australian Guide to Legal Citation requirement to do so. But probably more importantly from a practical perspective, because practice directions of various courts require to do that. Now, does anyone know what I mean by a practice direction? You could probably guess, but what do we mean by a practice direction? I'm just gonna mute while you some, put, put down some answers. I'm getting some good honest answers. Well, one at least. Okay, not sure. Judge made change to the process, rules. Yes, so practice directions are um, those documents produced effectively by courts to provide direction about the way in which matters should be conducted in court. So um, I'm attempting to call up a practice direction, but it's not coming up on my screen. So you can look at practice direction number 16 of 2013, for example, which you'll find on the court's website and I'll share the page. Now, are there any questions before I do that? All good? All right. So we'll just share the page now, if I can find the right one. So this is an example of a practice direction. It's number 16 of 2013, issued by the Supreme Court of Queensland. And it says, in relation to citation of authority, that where you are referring to a case, then you should um, use the judgment from a set of the authorised reports in preference to any other form of citation. So that gives you an example of a practice direction and you know where to find them, go to the court's website and you'll see that um, it refers to some basic rules of practice. Any questions so far or are we doing okay? You with me? All right. Um, and of course, if you're referring to um, something in your toolkit, you might put this sort of thing. The idea is that the authorised report is used because it's regarded as the most authoritative version of the relevant authority. So that's why parties are encouraged to be selective and to use the authorised report. Now in the Federal Court, we have the Federal Court of Australia National Practice Notes, which um, you should consider and we refer to them in the um, legal re the, the legal videos. So have a look at the Federal Court of Australia National Practice Notes, which provides some general guidance. And you can look at the Case Management Handbook, which is also a very useful resource when it comes to deal dealing with issues in the federal jurisdiction. Um, and you might have a look at the Law Council of Australia website to provide some assistance in that regard. Informit is also a useful research vehicle and um, some of the courts directly or tribunals have information that you should consider um, within the context of the work that they do.
Another thing that you might consider is um, using EndNotes and some uh, assistance through the library in that regard. All right, so are we all good with legal research? I'll ask you to do quite a bit of homework if you haven't already done that. So let's move on now to some discussions in relation to communicating as a lawyer. And I, I probably should take this opportunity just to say, when it comes to written communication for your assessment work, some of you would have noticed the Turn It In program. I'll, I'll just explain a bit about that. Um, so Turn It In is a program that's used by the university and its design is essentially, or to be honest with you, to ensure that what you produce as your written work is your own and that um, if you do refer to other people's work that you reference it appropriately. So it's a very powerful program. So when I receive your assessment work, it uploads with not only a percentage score that represents the percentage of work that you've produced compared to work that is otherwise publicly available, it also provides me with direct access to where the work that is sourced elsewhere is derived. So um, when I look at an assignment and I hit the, the Turnitin program, it will show me sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, where this material was sourced originally. So if, for example, you include a quotation from a case and it goes for five pay, sorry, for five lines, then it will come up you know, in a pink color or orange or some different color. And I then look to the side and it will say, this, this material came from this case, which is fine. Um, it will also show me where this material came from another student's assessment work. So it's a very powerful tool. Now, I don't want you to be scared by that. And don't necessarily assume that just because you have a relatively high Turn It In program, that that means that you must be doing something wrong. Quite the opposite. Um, the Turn It In score alone is not the only uh, relevant factor. For example, if you have a short written assessment, the student cuts and pastes an entire piece of legislation and properly acknowledges that that is the case. That's not plagiarism, even though the percentage score might be very high. So Turnitin does not test for plagiarism. It just matches the material against something else in the Turnitin program. And as um, Bandana says, it's a similarities report, which is spot on. So properly referenced, there are no plagiarism issues. And of course, it may not be the best writing. So if you see a high percentage score, it might encourage you to rewrite some or part of the piece um, or all of the piece, but it is a mechanism to highlight the possibility of intentional plagiarism, but it might also pick up unintentional plagiarism. So I don't want you to be overly scared, but I do want you to be aware of it. Are there any questions in relation to um, plagiarism? Emily says, what's a high score? Anything over 50%? Um, another says over 20%. It, the answer is it, it does vary on the piece. For, so for example, if you're um, on, the, on the portfolios that you prepared, there wasn't a lot of issue. There were, to my mind, there were not a lot of plagiarism type issues. But when it comes to the toolkit, it might show up very clearly if it's obvious to the Turnitin program that you have drawn your material heavily from what a former student prepared, for example. It'll pick that up pretty easily. So there's no hard and fast rule about what is a percentage score that is of concern. But put it this way, just because it says 60% and it has like red flashing light, that doesn't mean that you know there's a, a necessarily an issue. It just depends on what the percentage um, relates to, and I'll, and I'll check that out. Okay. Um, 
I'm now going to just talk about the use of appropriate sentences and in particular, the use of short sentences, sometimes at the start of a paragraph. You'll recall in my sample document that I referred to the writing of Lord Denning, which I find particularly appealing. Um, and in part, there's the use of the short sentences. Now, I don't want you to go overboard with this and use short sentences exclusively because that can become quite annoying and disjointed in its own way, don't you think? Um, so you need to balance it out a bit, I think, is, is really the key. Now, when it comes to writing, have a look, for example, um, in your textbook at, and I'm, what I'm quickly trying to do here is reference one chapter of the textbook, sorry, one version of the textbook with another because it does move around a lot. All right, um, for those of you that have got the current version, have a look, for example, at page 327, and you'll see at the bottom of that page, these words um, under the heading of the importance of effective communication skills. And it reads, lawyers are essentially wordsmiths they are experts at working with words in both written and spoken form. For this reason, learning how to communicate effectively in writing and orally is a critical focus for law students. So I think that's a very good paragraph as an example. Short sentences at the start, and then it builds and flows and it's internally consistent. Less appealing, is what is written immediately following, where you'll see that there's a series of dot points and it's effectively a list. Now, if you're like me, you might find that useful as a reference source, but not particularly to read. When I get to a, dot, a list of dot points, I tend to read the introduction, skim through the dot point content, and then get on to the next paragraph. So be aware of at least my practice in that regard. So you'd be aware that I probably don't like dot points, but they have their purpose. Now in the toolkit, dot points might be perfectly acceptable, might be absolutely the best way to go in terms of describing the material that you wish to describe, but that's not always the case. Um, so, Have a look at the think box on page 328 of your text. And this is probably about page 307 of the very first version. But it says, um, when you think of lawyers communicating, what are the first images that come to mind? Do you think of legalese? Do you think of jargonistic language and long words used in incomprehensible sentences? Or do you think of clear and precise communication using short words and easy to understand phrases? Of these two options, which do you think most accurately reflects the nature of legal communication today? And of course, the answer is the second, the former, um, sorry, the latter of the two. So um, when you think of legal language, and the communication skills of lawyers, you might think of pompous, jargonistic, arrogant, archaic language, and that's not what we want. So you do want um, those things that are simple and direct. Remember um, the threshold learning outcomes? Remember there were six threshold learning outcomes that we talked about in week one? There were knowledge, Ethics and professional responsibility was the second. The third was thinking skills. The fourth was research skills. The fifth was communication and collaboration. And the sixth, self-management. So what we're really talking about now are communication skills. And we do that in the context of collaboration as well. So when you look at your toolkit problem, the second assessment, 
and that's due fairly soon, isn't it? Can anyone tell me, remind me when it's due? This is a test to see how foremost this is in your mind. 19 September. So it's not too far away, about three weeks. And as you might expect, I do expect, I, do, I would like the assessment on time. And given that you've had the assessment all term, you probably will be disappointed if you ask for an extension, even if you are unwell or something cropped up in the last couple of days before it was due, because you had plenty of opportunity to present the work. So in conjunction with doing your legal research work this week, you probably should be looking to have at least a good first draft of your second assessment completed this week so that you've got time next week to add to it. A good rule of thumb is where you've got a timeline and an obligation, treat it as though it's due a week early, wherever you can. Same applies in practice. If you've got a court matter coming up, I often adopt a practice of thinking, well, let's assume it's on tomorrow and let's get that which needs to be done, done today. That way you can prepare the material and let it sink, let it sit. And you can go back to it in a couple of days time um, and absorb it. And it becomes your own more readily. Same with the legal um, toolkit. So the task overview requires you to start to think, speak and act like a lawyer. So the process of solving problems is something that is intended um, by the toolkit. Do have a look at the rubric and you'll see that um, for someone who prepares an advanced toolkit, I'm looking for a strong selection of resources that demonstrate a professional understanding of legal context. So tonight, for example, we have discussed a wide range of resources that are available to you. So I'm not asking for a long list of resources because I don't really like dot points and long lists. But what I'm looking for is a strong selection of resources. So if, for example, you have a particular platform that you prefer over the competitors, don't be afraid to say, this is the one that I use and this is why I use it, rather than necessarily giving them a list of ones that you could use. I'd rather see that you have a selection that works for you. The next is, in the rubric, that you're able to show a critical understanding of the application of the resource, including any weaknesses in the approach. Now that's interesting. So for an advanced toolkit, I'm asking you to critically understand how you might use the resource and then identify any weaknesses. So for example, um, it may be that this resource is easy to use, but it doesn't automatically show you the authorised report for a case and you therefore need to supplement what you do with that resource by doing something else to tweak it. That's just an example. The third thing is in your toolkit that I'm looking for you to demonstrate higher order judgment in auditing and curating additional resources for use as a reference work. The toolkit is meant to be practically orientated, primarily for you to use. Whether you're a lawyer or not, it's something that I want you to be able to refer back to, add to as you see fit, not just in this unit, but beyond the unit. And certainly for the immediate um, uh, issue for the third assessment, the take home exam, I expect that you'll you actually use your toolkit as the roadmap for answering the third assessment. So I'll be looking to see how you've put all this together in a thoughtful and useful manner. The next rubric is to demonstrate a commitment to excellence in professional development outside the curriculum. There's only so much we can talk about in the unit and there's so much out there that when I say to you, look, just go exploring, you may find some things that I haven't discussed during the course of the unit that's not available in the notes 
and that isn't available in some of the supplementary resource materials such as the um, legal research videos. The next thing is that we're looking to see if the toolkit is not only valued to you as an individual, but could be used to mentor others. And I see a typo, um, which is part of my voice recognition issue. So whether you could use it to mentor others. So that's the idea of the toolkit. Um, there's some material there, some observations from Associate Professor Scott Beatty that I'd like you to look at. There is no pro forma this time, but I think there is a, a rough outline that might be used as some sort of guide. Do have a look at um, uh, Professor Beatty's legal problem solving toolkit video and have a look at um, his other material in relation to uh, how to read legal material. Okay, um, you'll see that the Legal Problem Solving Toolkit has a number of aspects to it and uh, do make sure that you cover all of the things that we want you to cover in that. All right, are there any questions? Are we all good? All right, we're a bit early, but I'm minded to wrap up now because um, I'm sort of about to start a new area and I'd rather not start that just now. So um, Evie said, who did the videos just mentioned? Um, Associate Professor Scott Beatty from Central Queensland University. And um, I believe that I have provided access to some of those videos, but um, you should be able to find some other videos. So if you see videos from Associate Professor, they're very good. And Emily says they are in the assessment page. All right, thank you. All right, any questions then about legal research, about the second assessment, about the issue of communicating as a lawyer that we've started on tonight, but we'll continue on. Kieran says, um, is there a 2000 word count in the amount expected or the amount up to? I can't recall precisely, I think I did put in a 2000 word limit um, for the assessment. Can anyone remind me what was in there? I can have a look at it, but um, 2000, yep, 2000 up to 2200, yeah. So every unit coordinator will have a different view on this and you need to be mindful of the individual's view. So my view is, if I set a word count, it's not absolute. You can stretch it a bit. And if you go to 2,200, sort of that 10% rule of thumb, I'm not going to be too concerned. I don't mind doing a bit of extra reading. But certainly if you go beyond 2,200, um, you may find that I then look critically at the way you've used the words to ensure that you've used words economically. And if you haven't, then you, you can expect that um, I'll start to deduct some marks not necessarily because you've just gone over the word limit, that's not the test necessarily, but that you've not written in an efficient style. And um, uh, so if you go beyond 2,200, you won't necessarily be penalised, but I'll have a look at it and I may well penalise you for it. Um, alternatively, it might just be that I say, this is so good, I can understand it, I get it, you couldn't really, have, even though it, despite the quality of the writing, Given the content, I, I see why you couldn't stick to the word limit. So I'll be a little bit more flexible than perhaps others. Now others may say 2,000 words, strict limit, um, don't go beyond it and you must respect that. All right. So any questions then about the assessment? I've mentioned that you should have your first draft completed this week if you haven't already done so. All good? Okay, we'll see you next week at the same time. All the best, bye for now.